Thank you. It's just a great turnout, and I appreciate so much the interest and the excitement about the new programs that are coming to this college. Um, this could be in the future. It already is a great art school, but this, this could be a signature program for this whole, really, community college system, and um, that's a, an exciting thing to be part of. And so thank you so much for having me here today. Um, we're going to talk about brick sculpture. I'll tell, uh, briefly, I'll just tell you how it's going to go. We're going to first, we're going to have a little art history lesson, because you know you love art history. Um, and that's going to not only talk about art, the history of brick sculpture, which, which is a, a little part of it, but just some of the, the terminology and some of the examples of types of sculpture that is applied to the brick medium. So you should learn about sculpture in general through this. And then we're going to talk more specifically about the, the techniques involved with some demonstration about how brick sculpture is made. And then the fun part, or the funnest part, you get to make your own sculpture out of a single brick. And um, then that will be fired. And then you can pick it up once that happens. So uh, this is a program that I've, well, it's a variation on a program that I've been doing with Clemson students for about 15 years. Um, but it also has the other elements with the art history. So um, I've, done, I've never done quite all these things all at one time, so bear with me. Um, and here we go. Brick sculpture. People wonder, I sometimes say, did you invent that? I'm like, well, mm, yeah. The, <laughs> the Babylonians, this is the Ishtar Gates, so the, the restore, restoration of the Ishtar Gates from Babylon about 600 BC. Um, these were found about 40 feet under the ground in the, in the 19, early 1900s and, and uh, of course restored. The, this restoration is in Berlin actually. Some of the animals that are on there, which are brick sculpture, and we'll show you a, a close up soon, are um, in different museums from all over the world. And there's one in fact in the National Gallery in Washington DC if you get a chance to see that next. But first, this is a real different slide. Uh, I want to talk about some of the different kinds of sculpture before we get specifically in to, and some of the different techniques. Um, because we're talking mainly about relief sculpture. And if you know what that is, relief sculpture is, has a background, basically. Um, it comes from the Latin term levo, which means attached to a, back, to a backdrop. Uh, and so it's sculpture that, that has dimension in some way, but, but there's a background to it. Um, but the, but the sort of the, the antithesis of that is called intaglio. And that is, that is a, a surface that the sculpture is etched into it and goes into it. And that this is one of the more obscure examples I could find. These are the Blythe intaglios in uh, Blythe, well, in actually in Colorado, near Blythe, California. They were done by Indians, and they're, they're, they're very mysterious in that from the ground, you can see here, they, they didn't really know that they were there. It wasn't until 1932 that a plane flying over said, there's some stuff there. And um, you can see these images are really huge. And what it is is they etched through these dark pebbles that are on the surface of the desert into the lighter colored, lighter colored sub, subsurface. And, and made these things. They, they don't know how old they are. They estimate between 400 and 10,000 years, which is a pretty wide range. So they have no clue, which I that's what I love about these. Anyway, next. Um, a little bit more probably familiar with you is, uh, is this Egyptian sculpture. You can see all of this stuff is intaglio. See, it's all dug into the surface so that, so that it all goes in. But these figures are slightly different. And what this is is called, um, it's, it's, it's called sunken relief. Because even though it's below the surface, you can see that the dark edges there, it's still modeled so that it's, it's a combination. It doesn't just all sink in. And that's particularly noted, noted in, um, in Egyptian sculpture. Okay. Um, here's another Egyptian sculpture, same thing. It's pretty much detail, a lot of a lot of modeling, but you can see the surface is out all the way here, and it, and it goes in. So, so again, this is different than intaglio. This is, this is called sunken relief. Okay. 
Here's a detail from the Ishtar gates in Babylon. Uh, the, the, these were, there was 120 some animals on, on the gates and uh, this is glazed and it is a shallow relief. So it all sticks out from the surface of the wall. This is the wall and then it all, it all protrudes from that. Um, this is the earliest known existing brick sculpture. Okay. Um, this is, uh, I'm particularly interested in this because Tammy and I have been to a lot of the Mayan ruins. This is in Palenque in Chiapas, Mexico. And this is, uh, we were actually there when they were unearthing this particular section of the ruins. And this is uh, an example of, of what they call, what you would call this, this like a shallow relief uh, or a bas relief, if you've ever heard that term, B-A-S relief. And that is, means shallow, or it means low actually. Um, and basso relievo is the Italian, but it's, it means low relief. And this is, a, this is just, they were basically did a copy of it and duplicated the colors that they think were, were there initially in these sculptures. And then you have uh, what you call mezzo relief. You'll, you'll notice these terms are used in, in musical parts as well. Mezzo relief is middle relief, uh, so it's a and this is, a, this is almost a high relief, but not quite. You can see that, that a lot of it is almost three-dimensional, but then a lot of it is, is still attached fairly to the background. So, it's, so it has a lot of depth, but it's, not, but, but, but it's not as deep as it can be, as you'll see. Next. I like this. This is um, Ang Angkor Wat in um, Cambodia, and it's the largest religious temple that they know to exist. Um, it's a Hindu temple. And there's just all kinds of, it's a bit hard to see, but you can see this thing is just dripping with sculpture, all kinds. Um, some of it's high relief, some of it's low relief, everything. This is almost totally three-dimensional here. Um, just an example of, uh, of, of a, a building which is totally dripping with sculpture, which I love. What an idea. Next. And then high relief would be something like this. This is by Augustus St. Gaudens, the American sculptor. Uh, this is the... Uh, it's a memorial to the 54th Massachusetts, which is, was the first black regiment in um, the Civil War. And uh, you can see this horse, this, this whole figure with the, that's uh, General Shaw, I think, um, is three-dimensional. And then these are really high relief, and then you have a shallower relief here. So this is a combination of a, really of high relief, or relievo alto, and... Um, and middle relief and low relief. Okay. So that's your history lesson. Did you enjoy that? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to talk about how that relates to brick sculpture and of course all the projects you see here are going to be mine. Um, why would I show other people's? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the only one that does this, by the way. Um, I'll talk about this one later. We'll just move on. I love this quote uh, because what I do is mainly public art, as you saw in the last slide. I decided that we would never be civilized in the sensitive and human sense if we did not strive to have the arts in the broadest definitions become a part of the lives of all people. That's kind of a mantra for all performing artists, public artists, any kind of visual artists that exhibit. I, I, just, I just think that's right on. And so... Um, have to include that next. Okay. We're going to talk about the relief sculpture as it applies to brick sculpture. And now you know all about relief, so this will all be much easier to understand. This was a project in Greenville, South Carolina, and this is the architect's drawing of the, of the CVS pharmacy. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Greenville, but it's an incredibly art conscious community. And they wouldn't let them put this here with, without. Um, the downtown CVS. Yes, yes, this is downtown. Um, it took them 10 years to get permission to do this. That's, that's part of it. They made them do these windows. CVS said, we don't do windows, and they said, you do here. Um, but they also had these panels here, which are along a, public, a pedestrian area, and they said, those, uh, those affect the pedestrian experience, so you have to put art on those. There needs to be more Greenvilles out there. 
anyway, uh, we were commissioned to do a project. You can see it's a little hard to see. There's, there's panels. We didn't have to do them in every one, but there's three panels here which we inserted uh, into the building as it was being built. Next. First one is a history panel uh, showing the, this is Var Vardry McBee, who is the guy that sort of came in and started putting a bunch of mills in the town. There's a waterfall that runs right through town, incidentally, which is uh, magnificent. And so these are some of the things he was involved in building, church, or in donating land to churches, to Furman, uh, college, to, and so those are all like a montage of things that relate to him. This is, uh, and then there's just more details. You can, but you can see the kind of detail you can get. And this is a, this is kind of a, would be called a sort of a middle relief. It's, a, I did it in, in bricks that were eight inches deep. So they're, so it's not a shallow, it wouldn't be a low relief or a bow relief. This would be a middle relief. Um, this is the, what was on that site at one time was a Crest building and, and department store. And so I, I did something so it's sort of, the, this is how the building was built. And then I did kind of a, like a montage with a 50s sort of, uh, or 60s maybe, window shopping scene. Okay. And then just more close-ups of that. And so you can see it's, you know, it's, th these are almost totally three-dimensional figures. Um, so again, this would be middle relief. Or next, and then this is the last one, which is some of the more modern things in the community. This is a there's a suspension bridge that they're famous for, um, river walk, a bunch of art galleries in here, and the water, other part of the waterfall. And so it's, again, it's it's just things that are more what makes modern Greenville. The bridge looks like it's different from. Did you do the relief separate from the wall and maintain the mural? Yeah, it's, um, it's inset into openings in the wall. Um, and it is a different color than the yeah. wall. They had several different colors of brick on this particular building. Yeah. So it was intentionally done for it to stand out. Usually when I ask a question, you usually get to it later. But I'm yeah. just dying to know, did you come up with this design, or did they tell you what they wanted, or how did you come up with these? Um, we we agreed on the themes. We, we agreed on what do you mean by that? Mean and a committee that they put together with the architect, um, a historian who taught or teaches at Clemson, uh, no, not Clemson, Furman, um, and a few other people. We just discussed what the themes were going to be, and then I designed the thing. The, the cross section of the citizens. Of yeah, people. that was really just with the the developer, the owner and the historian in that particular group. But that happens a lot, by the way. You, you meet with, you, you have committees of people that, that are involved with the design, at least, in, at least conceptually. So that's what happened here. Okay, go ahead. Oh, this is more details. Um, we added this one because you may have seen it. This is on the courthouse right down the street here. Um, again, a historical montage of on this side and and uh, we just have one of the panels shown here. Um, this is a little bit lower relief. It's, it's done in one Y of the brick, which are, the bricks are, are this deep, and you, you only have about two inches to work with, so the, the, high, the, the deepest part of this is about two inches deep. So it's not as deep as, as the one you just saw, so this would be a bas relief. Um, Was that a creative decision on your part, or just the, the, the limitations that you had to work within per the commission? Uh, sometimes when the imagery is really small like that, it's, it, it can be a, because it's, there's so much to it, um, it, it can be a problem doing it in very high relief. And then some of it's, the, you know, what the budget is. It's a lot more work to do higher relief and you have to decide how much the commission is. But with that, we actually did some, back it up one, Tammy. We actually did some, um, Um, I don't know, you can't really tell, but there's a little bit of glazing, just looks like some wash glazes of like a manganese wash to, to give some shadowing to help it show up a little bit better. Yeah, you can, you can see a little bit of a little hard to tell, but it, so it, it gives it like a, a, a permanent shadow just in case the, the sun is not cooperating. And that also helps give it more feeling of depth, okay. This is just some of the various things. Some of these are some of the early things I did. I used to do architectural elements on, on homes. Um, 
signage. This is at Greensboro um, Emergency Services. This is Market Square in Reedsville, which is more recent. This was on somebody's house who lived on a golf course. I mean, there are just all kinds of, you know, there's ornamentation or, um, and signage is another element to this, which, which I've done in the past, okay. Um, a little bit more, this is UNCG's baseball stadium. You remember the glazing on the, on the Ishtar gates. The, this, this is glazed, but it's a, it's a slip glaze. It's, just, it's different clay bodies, so it's not a, it's not, it's not a glass glaze like, a, like, like you think of with pottery generally. It's, um, it's just different clay bodies that are of different colors that are applied to the surface and it's all fired at one time. So far, so good. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> They're just fired the same way. You have to get, you know, obviously, okay, so temperatures. It's the, it's the same kind of process as regular clay. When, I, when I'm finished with the sculpture, I, I, I put the slip glazes on. They have to be close, at least in temperature, so they mature at the, at, because it's the clay. Brick clay is a lower firing, firing temperature than a lot of the, than a lot of other clays, particularly the red. There's a lot of iron in the red clay. It fires lower than the. If you see lighter colored brick then it's fired at higher temperatures. There's a lot of um, the reason because of the, the, the thing that makes them light, the clay body is different and needs a higher temperature. Um, that one in particular too, the week after it was installed, went back and also stained the mortar joint. Yeah, that's why it looks so consistent. The mortar joints are also stained with a concrete. So uh, stain, that's called play at the plate. It's like all the things that happen at a baseball game, but it, it's on the press box that uh, UNCG's baseball stadium. This one, really hard to see. This is at the National Housing Center in Washington, D.C. Um, and you can see it's a right flyer. This is what I call a postcard thing, imagery, because they wanted something. They said, we want something that every, people from all over the world will know it's North Carolina. And so oh, that means we have to have a lighthouse, we have to have a, the right flyer, and a cardinal in a, in a dogwood tree, and all those things. So. Not a very exciting design project, but that was the assignment, so that's what I did. Um, this is a fire station in Pleasant Garden. It's one of the first of kind of a deeper, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly deep relief to that. I would say it's a middle relief. It's, um, and it's an, kind of an antique fire scene. You know, you have the bucket brigade, and you have the, the hand pump truck here, and the, and the reels that they brought in by hand. It's a really modern fire station, so I thought I'm gonna design just the a, you know, really antique fire scene to, to kind of offset that. And that was a fun project. That's at um, Junior Achievement Greensboro. Everybody sees that because they go to the Grand Theaters and they and you you can see it when you come out. So everybody's like, "Did you do that?" That's that's a really early piece I did 20 years ago, probably. Okay. Um, this is at Wilkes Community College. Uh, if any of you know what Merle Fest is, that's um, this is the grounds of Merle Fest. Doc and Merle Watson, and then this musical instrument freeze. This was a situation where they had a garden. They had a, um, a need to block off the end of a garden from traffic. This is a heavy traffic area. This is the garden of the senses. And so they wanted a sound barrier and a visual barrier from the car, from the traffic. So I designed the whole wall and then put these elements in. And this is the color of the brick on campus. Everything on the campus is this color. And, and then I used a red brick to insert to, for the contrast. Um, and so this was pretty successful. I like going to Merle Fest and watch people get their pictures taken inside this. Red, like was a, Doc able to experience this thing? Oh, yeah. The oh, he was. You guys probably know Doc Watson, great blind guitarist. And so I was just thinking that's an artwork he, he probably. He did. He rubbed his hands across it and he said, dang, I'm ugly, aren't I? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> he's he, a neat guy. But he also could tell what chord he was playing by throwing his, rubbing his hand across. Yeah, oh, he was, he was an amazing guy. Um, through this process, we got to know him really well. Um, and he just died. Okay, next. Um, this is, again, it, he, this is a church in uh, St. Paul's Lutheran in Durham. Uh, this is a, a building, a new building that was built, and they had this big blank wall because there's, it's a family life center. There's a stage on the other side. They, they couldn't put windows. And so the architect, 
in their wisdom, to, told the, uh, the church that they needed a brick sculpture to, to break up that wall. And so I, I worked with the church committee, which is um, a challenge. But uh, it, it had to be consistent with Lutheran theology, which seems simpler than it was. But, I mean, we got along. It just took, it took longer to design it than it did to make it. Um, and they wanted, they wanted the figures, see how primitive or, you know, there's lack of detail in this. They wanted really blocky figures. They, they didn't want too specific. Uh, you know, gender, age, that thing, but they didn't want to get like, oh, that looks like, you know, somebody, or, or then you get into different, you know, issues if it's, if it's too much detail. So they were, they wanted it to be this, you know, humanity in general coming to the cross. That was the theme, um, and in different ways. And so at one time I had somebody swimming towards it. They, they thought that was a little too much, but I, I might have taken the idea a little too far, but. Um, but we, again, it, it was an, an example of a way to br for architectural element to incorporate the art in, and break up the plainness of that, of that rectangular wall. Okay. Um, one thing that happened, I did a, was doing all these relief sculptures and I realized that you know, there's some limitations because these are, ha these are built into structures and I thought, well, you know, I need, I need to work on some freestanding stuff so that I can go for some of these public art commissions. Um, a lot of what I do are, there's call for artists and you compete for projects in different places. And most of the time that means you gotta put, do the whole thing. There's not something to build into, okay. So I started working on some uh, freestanding pieces. This is called Life is an Open Book. It's in Charlotte, uh, another piece that people see because it's on Tryon Street and right near the, the Panthers Stadium, and everybody, I mean, I meet so many people that know this sculpture. So it was a great location. Um, that's actually a book, that's a, I don't have a picture, but it's like cracked open, so it's a V-shape. Again, it's freestanding, but it, it's still like a high relief. I had this wall, and I, and I, you know, I did it more or less like a, like a high relief with these children like exploring this book. Um, it's in a park called The Green, which is all the themes are educational. And so that, that's what they gave us there. there. And there's artists from all over the country that did works all kinds of different mediums. And, and, but everything had to have an educational element to it, to the theme. Um, this is a project I did at North Carolina Arts Council grant uh, with a high school in Columbus County where they were involved actually in, in the design and, and helped make some of the pieces. Um, this was pretty interesting. Thing. This is the front of it, and that's the back. Um, well, from the street, I guess, if, if, you're, if you're judging from the street. But these little pieces here were inserts that the students made. And we, so I, I, they helped design the project, and then I had them come up with an ideal and design something that represented that ideal and make those pieces and, um, and put in there. They were scared to death, but they did a great job. It was, it was a lot to ask, but they, they, they did it. It was amazing. So, okay. So then I thought, okay, well, if I can do that, I can just do people that are completely freestanding. And th so I started doing these figures. And this is a, in Cary along Black Creek Greenway. They had a, a, an area they wanted to be, they wanted some seating. Actually, there was some seating there, some regular benches. And they said, well, we don't want to lose our seating. And so my goal then was to put some people some brick people in there, but still leave room for you to sit and sit, sit with the brick people. So um, this is part of a project called the Arts El Fresco, and it's all kinds of art be happening. She's a writer, by the way. That's what she's doing. You have this musicians, um, and, and so that's one part of a three-phase project, which has now become a four-phase project, but we've been working on this project the whole thing for about four years now, because when a new area of the Greenway opens, then we do another sculpture. Can be model for the writer? <laughs> no, but the people say it looks like her. Uh, here's another section of it with a bridge. Um, and so again, it's an art theme. So I have this potter here that's, you can see that's like turning this huge pot. And then on the other side, there's like a finished pot. And this was done by Tara Thulner, who, who's, <laughs> Yeah, who studied here. Tara worked for me for four, three, 
three years. And this was one of the, she was, she was great helping a lot of things, but this was one where I said, oh, I need a big pot, so you make that pot. And so that's, so she did, okay. And then. This is a, um, a footbridge, part of the greenway that goes over a railroad yeah. track. And I don't have a view from the other end, but at this end right here is this welder welding a piece of steel sculpture, and then, the, and then on the other side is this piece of steel sculpture. And on that one, I designed it and then took it to a welding shop and had them make it. So, and I'd had it rust because the bridge they left to rust, and so I rusted the sculpture so it kind of goes together. That was fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next. This is in Greenville, South Carolina again. Um, it's an allegorical theme. There's a river that runs through the town, and that represents the river, and there's an awakening, and then there's a, this is like the passing on of knowledge, and then at the end is this evolving into this architecture. Um, Greenville's this combination of the past and, and this incredibly modern architecture that's evolving into it. So it's a, it's a real eclectic place and I, I wanted to represent that. So, so that's that, okay. And this one is one you can see at Market Square. The, again, this was a sign, they, they had this electronic sign, one of those kind of annoying electronic signs that, are, that help because they're, they do actually function well. But, the park is so rustic that they wanted uh, to kind of a little kinder, gentler look to it. And so we built this brick signage um, or um, structure around it and then put figures on it. And the park is mainly far for farmer's market and there's a stage for performance. So this is, a, this is someone with a basket. that She's just been to the farmer's market and she's admiring her, her, her vegetables that she's just bought. And this is a musician on the other end. Um, one of my issues here was I had this thing right here, which was an electrical panel that I had to get into, or they have to get into, so I had to design it so you could get in behind him. So I, I made him kind of put, leaning up on his guitar, which is really not something you would ever do, but, <laughs> but that was, uh, it was, <laughs> it was a design issue. Okay. There's just some details of some of those things. And then you can see there's the relief in the back that, that I showed you earlier. So there's, there's a combination in different places here. Okay. Okay, and then I started thinking, I had a couple of projects where there were whole plazas, and I thought, well, this is a chance to, to incorporate several of these things in one. Um, you remember the, the Angkor Wat, the building that in uh, Cambodia that we looked at that had all kinds of sculpture all over it. And, and so it was that idea, except it's in a plaza where there's different, where you walk through different, different places. And so, go ahead. And so um, this is um, in Winston-Salem, and yes, it's out of Walmart. Um, and the reason for that is Walmart, as Winston would not let Walmart build unless they did a lot of things, and one of the things Walmart chose was public art, believe it or not. Um, you can imagine our reaction when we got that phone call. Yeah. Yeah, who is this really? Yeah. <laughs> they were actually really good to work with because the store couldn't open until we were done, and so right. I, had, I had this like, this little bit of, for a little while I had this power over the biggest <laughs> retailer in the world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All these things, it's called to build a community, all these things relate to Winston-Salem in some way. Uh, that's one thing I like to do with public art is make it relevant to where it is and so that it's not, it only makes sense in that place and I think that's, that's only fitting. Um, and so this is really relates a lot to, the, to some of the things. It's a little hard to see in the slides but this is sort of the arts montage here and there's Medical sciences, and there's, all, there's various things. There's like 12 different things that are represented. Okay. Point out the, um, the, the theater mask on one side and then the stars on the other. Oh, yeah, that's a little, this little, little theater little mask. And, there, and it cuts through the wall, and then on the other side, they're like looking at the stars. And the, mm. um, another part of it, and that's Old Salem scene, and just so it's various stuff. The, this is the, the downtown with some of the surrounding, and there's Pilot Mountain, and, and I did the, those buildings with the colored glazes to make the city sort of stand out differently. Okay. 
This is in Gastonia. This is the last one I'll show you. This is a um, plaza. Again, they had a, there were, there was, this commission was for a, a sculpture to go in a fountain. That's what, that's what they wanted. And, and brick is not really good to be completely constantly. It's fine with water, but not constantly. Um, you, there's, there's all sorts of, of things that you don't want to have uh, undesirable effects. And it's really not structurally, it's just aesthetically there's problems. So I couldn't really do that, but I kind of wanted the commission. So I, uh, I saw the, the drawing for this whole plaza and I said, you know, what they really need is, is something in that whole area. There was a lot of money in the project and I thought, so I sent them a whole different thing. I sent them absolutely nothing they asked for and, and they loved it. <laughs> So we designed this whole plaza. This is. Um, but it was what you sent was just the concept of your idea. Yeah. And then this was one where we worked with a a, a committee. Of, uh, yeah, with the community. with the landscape architect, which this fountain moved around about five times. Um, but what this is is the natural. Uh, if you've ever been down there, there's um, Kings Mountain and Crowder's Mountain. There's this, which are these weird kind of like Pilot Mountain. They're just in the middle of of all of flat land um, and so I wanted this kind of ancient history there and to be to be represented you know like where they are on the planet and then these are uh, Catawba Indian style pottery pieces um, the, the first known inhabitants there were the Catawba Indians which were there they were there at least 10,000 years they know and maybe more um, but there, there again was an issue when I started. I went to the museum there, the Shield, and was looking at original Catawba Indian, Indian pottery, and I thought, you know, I need permission to actually do this. It, it seems weird for me to copy their style. So, so I got the name of the cultural minister at the, at the um, Catawba Indian Nation, which is in, it's in South Carolina. And uh, anyway, I asked him if it was okay, or her. And she said, yeah. So that's the kind of thing you have to think about when you're copying designs, even though these are, these are like seats. They're not real pots, but they're, and they're huge. Their pots were this big, and these are like, but still, it's their imagery. And so I wanted to make sure that that was OK with them. OK. Um, and then as we move on, that's the ancient history, the early people. Then as we move on through here, we have the mill history. Go ahead. This is a thing like a mill scene showing the kind of child labor issues of the mill. There was a, it was not a good time to be a, a kid and a child of a mill worker. Um, so sort of the, I didn't sugarcoat it. You can see the despair on that little girl's face. The guitar is because a lot of the mill workers were from the Appalachian Mountains and they came in and, and worked the mills with the idea that they were gonna get rich. And of course they didn't, but they brought their music and so there was a lot of musicians there that recorded actually that um, in that Gastonia area. Okay. A little hard to see but in a, just another angle you can see the pots a little bit better here um, and looking from the back. Okay go ahead that slide's not too good. And then the third part is the is the future that's a little bit harder to represent and so there I did the freestanding people. Um, there's all these little bronze notes that are blowing through here they're embedded into the into the plaza and this squirrel is collecting them and they have things written on them that are ideals that we we actually got the community to come up with so some of them might say unity or or um, you know compassion or or things like that they are and they're etched into these things and this girl is collecting them and then he's got a bucket full and this kid is handing them up to this guy and then this little girl is like flinging them into the air so that they perpetrate throughout the town. My idea was if you ever did do other public art sculpture, you could continue these things through it and make a trail to your next public art pieces and people could follow this all through your town. I don't know if that's ever happened or not, but <laughs> left it open. Okay. And now I'm going to, that's really the, essentially the end. I, I am going to go on to the um, process so I'm going to show you that and then we're, I'm going to I'm going to carve a couple of little things what how, how are we doing on time no you're good okay mm -hmm. okay that um what was you said the artist did you get your did you submit your uh, bid to 
for Uh, public art commissions. Um, I I'm on all kinds of lists. I I I hear. I like one place. No, I hear about commissions all over the country, and we go for some. And North Carolina Art Council on their website. Yeah. That's the place to start. That's the best place yeah. to start. They you have can, a monthly listing of calls for artists. And there'll be calls for shows, some are for shows, some are for, for temporary exhibits, some are for public art commissions. So we, do, we get them all the time and we, we, look at, we look at the ones that we think that we might have a chance for that suit the work we do and we, we go for them. It's, it's hard because, you know, you're going against usually now you're going against 70 or 80 people from, you know, three or four different countries. <laughs> it's it's getting hard. It, I mean, it never was easy, but it's getting even harder. So, um, okay, uh, the process. All my secrets are going to be revealed right now. Um, this is a really old process thing that I did. I'll, I actually, I'll go through this first, and then I'll demonstrate it. it might be best. That's why I look so young there, because I was. Um, um, this is on UNCG's soccer stadium. It was my first kind of large scale project. Uh, and it was from early 90s, I can't remember. Maybe 1990. 80s, I think. So um, that's why I look so young. The, um, this is the wall laid up and this is unfired brick. It's, it's in the form of a brick, as you can see, but it's not been fired yet. And so the drawing here, I've just got the drawing etched onto it. I projected that. I had a I made just a contour drawing of my design, projected it on there, drew it out, and you can see I've started carving away a little bit uh, here. Then the process continues. This figure, a lot more detail in this figure. You can still see the drawing, so you can see the progress here where, where two of the figures are starting to come out. Um, and then down here, further along, and so I finished. Now I'm taking it down. You can see I'm numbering the pieces and stacking them right here. Each piece is being numbered. Okay. Okay, now they've been fired, and I'm, I'm laying them out in the studio and then packing them up to be installed. And then this is at the job where, they're, where masons are, are laying the sculpture. Um, so simple. What's the working? I mean, you're working in unfired clay, and that's a pretty big piece. How, what's the window of opportunity for working that clay before? Well, you, you, I have plastic all over the place, um, layers and layers of plastic. You can spray it down, but I mean, you're fighting a losing battle. But the thing about it is, is that particularly when you get into the final stages, you need it a little firmer to get the detail. So at different stages, you want, you want a certain amount of, of drying. Um, but sometimes it, it gets a little ahead of you. And once it gets to a certain point, you can't just keep wetting it down. You start to, if it gets too dry, you start to weaken the clay body because you can't get the consistency. Um, so it is an issue. Um, I've tried also putting like, hum, um, vaporizers under plastic and letting them steam so that it takes slowly. Uh, it's whatever it takes. But um, I, can usually, I can usually get them done in a reason, you know, without having any issues. Sometimes around the edges I have to replace a few pieces that get dry. It's not a big deal. Um, are there any other questions about this part? I guess we could do that. And Did you go back to your first uh, slide where you first start this process? Oh, go, go back to. Uh-huh. Oh, I'll show you that. I'm, yeah. 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 In fact, we can start that right now, I think. Um, here's, here's some easy questions. Okay. This is what you think of as a brick, right? And there's, there's a difference in these two. What is it? <laughs> 
Okay, the first thing is uh, core holes are great when you're laying brick, lousy when you're making sculpture. So I, when I get material, I have to get solids. That's a fired solid. Um, now this is a regular size brick and these are actually pavers. They're a little bit larger anyway, but you can see the difference in the size. Like I said, this is, this is smaller because it's, it's, it's th three eighths inches smaller anyway, but still you can see the height change, the thickness, there's a quite a bit of shrinkage. There's about 7% shrinkage in the firing from the green material to the, to the fired brick. When I'm doing, so if I'm doing one Y of the brick, one like to be laid into a brick wall, this is the material, that's what the material, the size of the material that I get. If I'm doing some of the, the larger figures and the three dimensional figures, I, that's, I need deeper bed depth. And this is, the, this is the bed that goes this way. This is what's laid into the wall. So I get units that are eight inches deep, so this would be the surface, but you can see I can go really deep into this and still have enough material left. So or 12 inches deep. <laughs> that's, a, that's a chunk there. That's a chunk of clay. I do. I do. I just... Um, I get it mostly... This is all from Pine Hall, which is... if you. For those who don't know, it's in uh, Madison, so it's a local company. Um, their paver plant makes my material. And I can just say I need 512s and 808s, and, and they just, you know, they just make it to order that way. Um, and they wrap it up. So they, they run it, they run the material, they wrap it in, on, put it on pallets, wrap it in plastic, and, and then truck it to my studio. And then I unwrap it as I need it. So you can see that that's important is for the freestanding. Um, I also wet the clay down. This is an example of a model. See that guy over there? You remember the Kerry project, there was the, the guy playing the fiddle. That, with the freestanding I do scale models. And so I scaled up from that to make that, that guy. Saves a lot of time. I obviously have a lot of clay when I carve this stuff and so I wet it back down and make sculpture out of it. It's a great modeling clay. Um, it's coarse. Wouldn't be a great clay to throw, even though I actually Tara th tried it some and with limited success. But it's, it's very coarse because there's a lot of shale in it and a lot of grog is designed to be absorbent so that mortar absorbs into it. And that's a, that's a big issue. If the clay body's too tight, then you, it, it won't hold mortar and you won't get a good bond. But it's a great clay to sculpt with. Um, if anybody wants to feel what that's like, I'll pass it around. If, I know you potters got to feel clay. So, so I, I, we wet down barrels. I mean, we have so much clay. But if any of you want any clay, you can come and get it because we, we end up th uh, dumping a lot of it. This is the process. This will answer your question. Um, I have various ways that I, that I do spacers when I'm laying up walls. The simplest way is plywood. And it, these are laid back enough so that they still support the, the wall. Now, actually, I would put little clay spacers out here. But this also helps with my depth. So when I'm sculpting, I know that I've, that I've gotten to a place where I need to stop. Because you need to leave about two inches at least about two inches of your bed depth to have enough structure uh, so you can't cut any deeper than that. So these are good indicators. Um, when I'm doing the, the bigger pieces with, the, with these large units, I can't do that because obviously there's no way to, to support it. So I, use, I have them make clay spacers. They're the same dimension, three, um, three eighths of an inch to a half inch, and, uh, but they're, they're carved out of the same clay. And, and are cut out of the same clay. And then I can use those for the spacers. So I have to space them however the bond is. 
This is the bed joint, and this is the head joint. So this is a running bond. This is what you normally see with a brick wall, but sometimes a bond can be different. This is what they call a running bond. Okay, so I've laid, I've laid it up, and I'm, getting, I'm going to do the sculpture after this. Uh, okay, I, um, I'll tell you what, let's do something bigger. All right, this is not going to look like this. This is what it's supposed to look like, but for the sake of demonstration, I'm just going to put them all together like this. Does everybody understand what I'm doing? Don't be confused. Don't be confused. Actually, you could do something. Sometimes I do these tiles, too, which are done differently with really, really thin mortar joints. Um, I want to give you a better, a bigger idea of what it looks like, which is why I'm doing this, when you actually start sculpting. It'll work. The tools that I use are really simple, most, for the most part. I mean, some of them are pottery tools. You, you potters know what that tool is. Um, this is a really nice sculpting tool that for making like large models of people that make models of cars, like real cars, uh, use these, these kind of tools. But a lot of the stuff is just whatever works. The, uh, this is a homemade tool with, made out of the straps. Well, now they used a nylon thing, but they used to use steel for the straps that they strap cubes of brick to. So I've, a lot of the tools that are homemade, that's one of my favorites. Um, things that will texture because texture you'll see is really, really important. Uh, that's a fish scaler, uh, my favorite tool. That is amazing what you can do with that thing. Um, when I go to the dentist, I say, have you got any worn out tools? There's a great, for small detail work, the steel in those tools are so hard and this clay is so coarse, it'll wear them out in no time. So um, these hold up really well. And then I just keep sharpening them and then I'll go back to the dentist and get more. Um, some, you know, some like like pottery wood pottery tools. Sometimes, particularly when the clay is really wet, the wood is better; doesn't stick as much as the metal. So, so you know, when in, at certain phases, the the wood tools work really well. Wire brushes, anything. I mean, I, it's it's such a low tech, inexpensive way to uh, to make art work. That. Um, which is a, one of the real advantages. Okay, so I've got this. I'm going to project an image on there and sculpt it out. What I do is I, let's just say, we'll just do a shape of some sort. We'll do a blob. There it is. There's my blob. So I project my image. I draw it on there. The first thing I do is, is, is get my outline. There's several ways to cut away. Um, is it better if I'm over here, or does it matter? I'm in your way, aren't I? I don't know where to go. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll switch around. That's good. You can kind of see that it's firm, but it's, it's not too bad to carve. So I'm going to get the background carved out first. And again, this is just like, you know, a putty knife. So you, I bought it at like Big Lots. It's a great one. I think you can already see why I have so much leftover clay. So we run out of trash cans. <laughs> All 
My blob is coming to shape. All right, so now I've got the outline going a little bit. Um, if I want to, this would be like the Egyptian. You remember when I said the sunken relief? This would be the, that kind of thing where the figure, if I actually modeled this, would be, would be that kind of thing where it's all in the same plane. For low relief, what I generally would do then is, is cut this back to make this project. This loop tool is really good for that. I do sometimes when I'm really doing a lot of projects and or a lot of hours in the studio. This doing this all day. I have a wrist brace and an elbow brace and a, I can tell I, the effects of doing this for 25 years are starting to really uh, show. my edge a little bit. All right. Now, if I'm if I want that's all still flat, so I probably want to model that in some way. So there's, you know, there's that's when some of these type tools come in good and you can really start to to add form to it, add contours. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> okay, so I mean you can see there's, there's no point in the imagery being of any significance, but I'm starting to lose a little bit. So if I want to go back in and really define that line, then I might go and do that. But basically, one of the main ways that you get your look is how deep your relief is. If it's if you're doing it deeper, it's going to catch more shadow and play in the light differently. Um, and be more dramatic generally and more and look more three-dimensional. Well, it is more three-dimensional, but it's going to have more of that effect. But there's other things you can do, and these are, this is one of the things I want you to think about. So the depth of, of the, re the relief is one thing, but texturing becomes a way that you can manipulate and make a, and get a value range in the sculpture. And if you think about one of the things that I like to uses an analogy if you've ever done pen and ink drawings and you know t with shading you're you're I mean you're working with like if it's black ink and that's what you're working with on white paper then black and white is all you have and so to get shading there's things you do there's stippling techniques and there's cross hatching things like that that you can get a, a value range by, by different techniques and it's a little bit like this except this is this is actually three-dimensional in the way that that works but um, any kind of like raking the surface with um, with any of these tools that I have will give you a darker value, so it helps it helps set it off. The um, where's my fork? Fork is really good. You can get. I told you I love my fork. You can get um, a really dark value with a fork by raking. I usually rake at a 45 degree angle to the, I mean, at a 90 degree angle to the, to the surface of whatever I, I have. So it gives kind of a haloing effect, but it also gives that sort of even thing. But, but there's also, there's other things you can do. We'll do something here. Um, and this, this goes really to that pen and ink thing, that stippling thing. Uh, you can do like a poke it, you can poke it. Um, 
these are areas that are always, and you know, I'm, I'm dealing a lot with what I do. I'm dealing with outdoor sculpture, and it's going to change as light changes. Uh, at times, it's going to be, when it's really bathed in sunlight, it's going to be hard to see because it's, you know, it's, it's just overwhelmed by the sunlight. But these are things you can do that will actually give some feeling of dimension no matter what because it's hard for light to penetrate all these little all these little holes that I'm putting in here. Um, It's not the most exciting thing to watch right now, but. <laughs> Looks like a dog, doesn't it? It's like underdog. Let's give him an eye and a nose. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> There he is. Um, okay. I'm going to show you. Let me. Oh, I, I forgot one thing. You remember when I told you about slip glazing and I showed you an example of the baseball players, and there was a question about that. Here's if I was going to do some glazing, put some spots on my dog. Um, this is just another clay body. You mix it up really thick, like that. I would. I would really rough it up some if I was going to do, I'll put a couple of spots on it, white spots. I'd rough it up more than that. But it's done in the same, you know, it's a, it's a single firing, so you do it in the same process. Again, you have to make sure the clay is mature at, cl at pretty close to the same temperature, which means you need a lower firing light colored body. Um, a little hard to find sometimes, but it's available. And you just paint it on. Look at a big white spot right there. Yeah, uh, I've done some of, some of these have been in place for, that I've glazed for probably close, maybe 15 years, and so far so good. Um, so I would let that dry. I'd build it up a little bit more, but it's, it has a, doesn't have a lot of thickness to it. And um, there he is, dog with a white spot. He needs one there, too. <laughs> is it ready? Time. Okay. Got to put him in a spot there. He's beautiful. Okay. So, glazing is another thing that's not something that you're concerned with now. Here's the tools, it's almost your turn. Here's the tools that you have, and believe me, they don't look like much, but you can do amazing things with these tools. A nail, and again, this is the same material that I make these tools out of. Now, I, I couldn't make you all tools, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you have these that you can use a number of ways. As a loop like this, they're really good for cutting You can take this end and draw with it or cut also if you want to cut areas away. You can see how lovely that is. So that's, that's your multi-tool. And then the nail for drawing, for, you know, you can experiment with different textures, um, whatever you want to do. I don't want to t tell you exactly what to do. But the idea is that you want to experiment with and get a feel for the medium and, um, and make make a sculpture. You're going to get one, where's the, just give me a, a regular. This makes a mess. You're going to get one brick. You can 
make it a three-dimensional sculpture. You can make it abstract. You can make it. You can do anything you want with it. The idea is that you get a feel for it. Um, push it. I mean, this material can take a lot. It can't. You can overdo it, but if you do, then you've learned what the limitations are. Um, if you want to do something on one side or two sides, it doesn't matter what you want to do. But you can just treat it like a like a chunk that you're carving out of a totally three-dimensional sculpture. You can do it that way. Um, it's really interesting when I do this with Clemson students. I've done it for so many years, and I, you know, there are some duplicates, but it's amazing the variety of things that people come up with. Mm -hmm.